Hello and welcome to The Sexually Satisfied Woman. I am your host, Eva Blake. And in this series, I'm talking to a variety of experts who are uniquely qualified to discuss some of the most common challenges that women face in our sexuality. And over the course of this series, my hope is that we are gonna offer real practices and proven strategies to boost your confidence, ditch the shame, and create truly remarkable relationships and really juicy intimacy so that you can have the sexual satisfaction that you deserve. And it's a good, good juicy pleasure of mine to be here with uh, Betty Martin today. She has had her hands on people professionally for more than 40 years, 30 years as a chiropractor and 15 years as a certified surrogate partner and somatic sex educator. She says some of it is legal and some of it is questionable. So that's fun. We're going to talk about that today. <laughs> And these days, her passion is training other hands-on practitioners in consent skills and how to teach their clients empowered choice so they can stop doing what they think they're supposed to and start doing what it is they want to. Her class for practitioners is called Like a Pro, and it has taken her all over the world. She is also a longtime cuddle party facilitator and is part of the team that trains, certifies, and supports new facilitators. Her new book is called The Art of Receiving and Giving the Wheel of Consent. So welcome, Betty Martin. Thank you. Thank you. I am really... I'm really excited about your book, The Wheel of Consent. I'm excited about this piece of work. Uh, my experience has been that it has been a real paradigm shift for myself, for my clients that I've worked with. So I want to spend some time talking about this piece. Right. I would love if you could give us kind of the 30,000 foot view, right? What is this piece of framework and how does it help us understand our sexual and emotional interactions? Oh, that's a great question. The 30,000 foot view. I like that. Um, the wheel of consent is a model that's based on the fact that when I'm touching you, I can touch you the way you want, or I can touch you the way I want. And that both of those are important and needed. And it's important to be able to tell the difference. So Excuse me. So it separates the who is doing question, which you can you can tell by looking in the window, see someone stroking down someone's back. You could tell who was doing, but you couldn't tell who it was for because that depends on your agreement. Beautiful. And that it turns out that who it's for is a really important factor that most people don't think about um, until you learn about it. And then you realize that you've kind of been confused for a while That's what it is a long while maybe yeah, yeah for most of us <laughs> right so who is this for is part of one of the three questions that you ask right who is this for what do you want and what can I give with a full heart and mm -hmm. I find these to be so revolutionary but I'd love for you to unpack for us what is the significance of us actually knowing that of us being able to answer that for ourselves. Of, of which question, who it's for, of what, what it is we want? Any or all of them. Okay. <laughs> well, the way I started exploring this was when I started working with clients in, in um, somatic sex coaching, I would often ask people how they wanted to be touched. And once in a while they knew, but most of the time they didn't know or they confused it with thinking I was asking, how can I touch you that you don't mind terribly much, which is a very different question. Right. So how I would say, how would you like to be touched for a few minutes? And they would say things like, well, I don't know. No one has ever asked me that. Or um, you're the expert. What do you think I should want? Or. Um, I don't know, gosh, I sometimes I like X, Y, Z, or, well, you could such and such, I guess, which it's true, I could, but that is not, that was not the question. And mm -hmm. so just being asked how people wanted to be touched, just opened so many doors of awareness for them and, and also for me of like, why is this so hard? And why do people get confused when we're asking what 
when someone's asking us what we want, why is that confusing? Like, it's a really simple question, but it's a hard question because often, of course, we don't know what we want. Um, and, uh, and it's a vulnerable question. Of course it is, because as soon as you notice what you want and ask for it, you're now vulnerable because someone could laugh at you or ridicule you or shame you or say no or, you know, any number of things. So it's inherently vulnerable to ask mm -hmm. for what you want. Of course it is. Yeah. Right. Uh you know, I, I didn't think about these questions. Um, how would I like to be touched? Um, you know, I think that I was in that camp until I, until I started doing sexuality specific work. And so mm -hmm. I was in classes mm -hmm. directly trying to learn. Right. And then yeah. I was, you know, called into the field and I was like, okay, now I'm going to, you know, do this work with other people. Um, but I was also in that camp of like, what can I tolerate for a little while? Yeah. <laughs> Until we can go from like where we are now to like where I think would be fun to go. Yeah. Right. I was yeah. definitely exactly. um, in that position. And it is so confronting to, yeah. you know, to answer that, not just to be vulnerable, but it really like shines a flashlight in the eyes. We're like, yeah. I, well, what if I don't know? And yeah. is this going to be okay? And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious for you, you know, in this work and in creating this, um, this framework that we are all so very blessed with, right? Um, how, how do we find the answers? To what it is we want? Yeah. It's really simple. You just stop what you're doing and you wait. Which, you know, the, the idea that, well, I don't know what I want we speak of it as if that's a problem, but it's not a problem. It's only a problem if you're in a hurry to get going. If you're not in a hurry to get going, you realize that that question is a luxury. It's like, wow, somebody wants to know what I want and I have all the time in the world to ponder and notice what that is. That's an astounding luxury really but it doesn't feel like one because of the vulnerability um, and it's not a problem not to know there's there's always times we don't know of course there are so that's not a problem unless you're in a hurry to get going or you think you're supposed to be in a hurry to get going then it's yeah. a problem and usually you know a few seconds 30 seconds maybe a minute it, it'll bubble up when you just sit and wait for it and um, and notice a part of that, of course, is being able to tune into your body and notice. So there are a couple of ways to do that. One is you just sit and wait and the, the bubbling up will, will come from your body up into your brain and you'll notice, oh, oh, I would like my arm scratched or, oh, I would like my ear massaged or whatever it is. Another way is to just kind of take a little scan around yourself. Okay, who wants to be touched? Is it shoulders? Is it arms? Maybe it's my back. Oh, my foot. My foot's talking to me. You know. Um, but yeah, and it, as you as you practice it in this very simple setting of being asked how you want to be touched, you're the the pathways from your body up to your brain it's get clearer and so that ability to notice what you want gets easier and easier and starts to expand out into your life mm -hmm. and it Thank may be so that much, what you yeah. want is time to think about what you want <laughs> yeah. I love I love the reframe right especially the piece about um not knowing what we what we want is not a problem because yeah. I think there's so much pressure yeah. that we're supposed to know and act, right? And we're supposed to be in active motion all yes. the time. Yes, by golly, and, it's going. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. We should have already been there, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I, I love this, you know, I love this piece of advice that it is, it is okay for us to slow down. It's okay for us to stop. It's okay for us to allow that to be a luxury. And that even when you said that, I just felt this 
great sense of relief. Like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. actually have to hurry anywhere, right? There's no yeah. fire in the building. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, that's a great expression. Yeah. Um, I also really love the question that you ask. Um, you know, what can I give with a full heart, right? And it really, when I have worked with um, the wheel. Uh, in in all of its quadrants, and you know, for all the folks who are watching, you know, you will have a chance to to figure out or to learn all the details. But um, you know, as I was really thinking about that, what do what do I really want, and who's it for, and what can I give with a full heart? I would notice for myself that there would be moments where I'm doing something and I'm not happy about it, and I feel like I have to, and this kind of sense of duty or obligation. And mm -hmm. so this question really allowed me to again, step back and slow down. And mm -hmm. like, there's no fire. I don't have to do anything. Right. Yeah. And it feels, right. it feels very liberatory to ask this question. And I'm curious yeah. with the folks that you've worked with in the times that you have taught this, what, what are other people experiencing when they come into contact with this? Uh, pretty much what you described. A lot of people, when you ask them what they want, people don't know or feel vulnerable or all the things that we just talked about. And when someone asks you for what they want, like maybe I want to run my hands through your hair, or maybe I want to explore your hand or something, or maybe I want you to rub my back, whatever it is. When people are asked to do something or asked to be allowed to do something, very often it's exactly what you described. One person said, well, it never occurred to me that it didn't have to happen. Yeah. Like, well, I, I'm supposed to be okay with it. And what's wrong with me that I'm not okay with it? And I should be okay with it. And I should stretch myself. I should push myself. Like, if I'm not okay with it, I should do it anyway, because maybe I'll like it. Terrible advice. Terrible advice. Um, so yeah, that's very common. And, and I think it kind of, I think it comes from our childhoods, mostly that we got punished for saying no. I mean, do you know anyone whose parents said, gee, Susie, you know, you, you do a great job of saying no, I'm so proud of you? Probably not so much, you know. Yeah. 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 So I think it, it comes from a similar place that, that also that feeling that we were just talking about of, well, I'm supposed to be okay with anything. Um, we're, I, I talk about this in my classes that we're, all of us are touched in ways that we don't want and that we don't like, and that we are powerless to prevent before we can talk. So it's very deep in our psyche. It's very deep in our nervous system. We know how to go along with stuff that we don't like. Mm -hmm. And because it happens so early, we we have learned that this is the nature of touch. The nature of touch is that stuff happens to us and we have to deal with it. And so learning that we do have a choice about it, sometimes we have the chance to learn that and sometimes we really don't have the chance to learn it very much. Mm -hmm. But learning that um, is a profoundly liberating that I have a choice about how I'm touched. Wait a minute. I do, you know, that's profoundly liberating. Yeah. And there's something else here that you're, that you're touching on too, which is that, um, you know, in my experience and, and when I've worked with clients, there's like, these are the things that I like, I, th I think, right. These are the things that I absolutely do not like, but there's like a really wide gulf, yeah. right. Yeah. In all that space of, you know, I'll, I'll try it for you, or I'm not really sure, or it's happening, but I can't really feel anything, or mm -hmm. I haven't made my decision up about that, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's so much, um, there's so much space between the two poles of what I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah. I'd like to ask Thank you this for that space. Yeah. <laughs> Right. It's full of opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so I want to ask you about, uh, 
uh, about this idea of staying even. And, you know, we mentioned it, you mentioned it earlier about, you know, when you say, when someone asks you, how would you like to be touched? And it becomes a very vulnerable place, right? And this idea that if we say even, and if we do the same thing over and over again, and we're always the giver, right? I find that a lot with my clients that they're usually some somewhere I'm, I'm always trying to serve. I really want my partner to be happy. I'll do when it, anything that they want. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when they see this wheel of consent, they're like, Oh, I didn't know there were so many options. First mm-hmm. of all. Right? But what do you mean by staying even? Well, you know, in your, um, uh, you know, in your framework, staying even, keeping us out of the pleasure zone, right? We stay in the same quadrant or we do the same thing over and over again, as I understand it. And, you know, so I was thinking about this idea of if we do the same thing, um, even if we're really good at that thing, it takes a lot of risk to try something new. Oh, yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, And yet, you know, I, I want to unpack, like, what is the value of us taking a risk in trying to, to not only touch, but be touched in different ways or, um, asking for something different, or just even being in the process of naming the way that we want to interact in a Mm -hmm. new and different way, Mm -hmm. right? What is the, the value of taking that risk? That's a great question. I want to clarify the use of the term risk. Great. Because it, it's total risk to say, would you move your hand, you know, an inch to the left or something? It's like, it's a total risk because you could get shamed or whatever. But um, so I would tend to say, well, uh, you know, start with small risks and, you know, your confidence will grow. However, a lot of people will interpret that to mean try things that you're not comfortable with, which is another way of saying, try things that you don't really want, which I don't buy because we already have plenty of practice at doing stuff we don't want. Nobody needs more practice at that. And when you do, when you kind of ignore your own boundaries and say, well, I'm going to make myself do this thing because it's good for me, then your nervous system goes into resistance and your pleasure system just can't engage really. So what I think is a much more interesting approach is to notice what it is that actually sounds great and go there. And then your, then your pleasure systems kick in and then you start just sort of automatically, you become interested in, oh, maybe I want to try that. Or, oh, maybe I want to try that. And, and also it means expanding the options of what you might ask for. So in, in sexual play, you might think, well, I'm I'm supposed to ask for a hand here, or I'm supposed to ask for a pounding there, or I'm supposed to ask for something, you know, involving an orifice or something. Um, But what if you expanded what it was possible to ask for? Maybe it's, I don't know what I want. I want five minutes to ponder that. I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Or maybe it's, I want you to go bring me a drink of water. Or maybe it's, I want you to cuddle me while I think about that. Or I want to take a nap. Or I want to take a rest. Or um, you know what? If you really want to turn me on, let's get up and do the damn dishes and then I'll relax. You know? So if you if you expand what it's possible to ask for, there is something that sounds wonderful. Even if it's, you know what? I just want to take a nap. Will you just come back in 20 minutes? You know, there's something that sounds wonderful. And it's our job to notice, pay enough attention to ourselves to notice what that is and to trust it. Like that's real information. And when we follow what it is that we want instead of what we think we're supposed to want, everything, everything changes. 
Yeah. So when I say, when I say take a risk, I'm not saying do something that you don't want to do because you think you should do it. I'm not saying that. It's, it's really kind of more risky or more scary to listen to what you actually want. That's what the real, that's where the real work is. Yeah. And that's where, yeah, that, that's where it really gets kind of scary. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to ask to have my feet rubbed. Like, yeah. Right. To really show up and be truthful, be honest, be really uh-huh. clear. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we've been talking about this framework called the wheel of consent. Um, but I'd love for you to share with us, how do you define consent? Oh, consent is a great word. It's actually, it's a terrible word <laughs> because if you look it up in the dictionary, which I did a year or two back, I thought, well, I'm teaching this stuff. I should look up and see what it means. It means um, being willing to do what someone else wants or willing to let them do what they want to you. It's essentially saying yes to what somebody else wants. There's nothing in there about asking for what you want. It's being willing to do what somebody else wants. Well, that's an important skill, but it's only half the picture. And so this is why a lot of people think consent means permission, but permission means I'm letting you do what you want. I'm giving you permission to do what you want. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also a useful skill, but it's only half the picture. What if I'm asking you, would you please scratch my back? Where does permission fit in there? It doesn't fit, it just doesn't apply. So consent is way more than permission. Um, and technically it means being willing to do what someone else wants. But I, when I use it, I've expanded it to really mean more of an agreement. If you say, get consent, or give consent, you're talking about that, um, that permission to do something. And I think of consent as being something that you arrive at together mm-hmm. that often involves a little bit of a conversation, sometimes a big conversation. Um, but I think of it more as agreement. And really, the, the wheel of Consent should be called a wheel of agreement, but it's too long. So, <laughs> so we use consent, but um, um, that's the problem with consent. It's about what somebody else wants. Mm. I, I appreciate, again, that reframe as well, that it is, it is about a conversation. There is something okay. that we're, we're creating together. And so okay. often these ideas of giving and receiving, I'm going to touch you or you're going to touch me is very unidirectional right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's yeah. something is going to happen to you or something is going to happen to me, which is very different okay. than we're coming together to create the, the dinner together, right? Yeah. And then we're yeah. going to have something that we're going to both enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you have something um, called the three minute game as a way to, uh, to play with these ideas of touch and um, experience and leaning into what something feels like. Um, okay. I'm curious why it's important to use a game like this to create great sex with someone or just great relationship and communication. What mm-hmm. makes a game like this so valuable? Well, a game like this um, creates a container for, and a container is just a set of expectations or agreements. So if we're making out and rolling around and getting handy with each other, we have some idea if we've been together before how it's going to go or who's going to do what and what it means and you know who's supposed to feel what and we have this kind of idea where we're going with the game like the three minute game that is off the table i mean the that that assumptions are are no longer apply so we have a different set of agreements And in the three minute game, our agreement is we're going to ask these questions and we're going to take turns. Um, And and it's for a limited time. So 
and we're doing it to experiment, to learn something, to to just see what we find. It's a very different expectation than your normal route to sexual play. And for the Wheel of Consent I, and the Three Minute Game, I do recommend that people set aside a time and create a container in which you're, you're setting a timer, you're agreeing to take turns, and when you're in your turn, you're not switching it up. I mean, you're not, you can change what you do, but you're not changing, you're either receiving or giving, you're not changing that part. Um, so it, it, it lets you dive into an experience and, and experiment in ways that would never happen otherwise, because it's just too intimidating. So just to be clear, the, the three minute game is a game that you play. The wheel of consent is a model of basically what happens when you do that. So you can use them interchangeably or not as you like. Great, thank you. I I have played the, the wheel of uh, the three minute game before and you know, I have to say that sometimes being in those moments where I have to say what I want, right? Whether it's the way that I want to touch you, right? Or the way that I am asking you to touch me, that sometimes there is this moment of like, oh my God, did I make the right choice? Yeah. Yeah. Change your mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And that's exactly, you know, that's exactly the thing that it helps us practice, right? Mm -hmm. Is is not only being present in the moment, but being willing to change my own mind, to have, mm -hmm. to feel differently inspired, yeah. right? And I think yeah. that that Absolutely. is something that's so valuable that we, you know, we don't get a lot of um, encouragement about yeah. that. It's okay yeah. to change the shape of our interaction as yeah. we need it to. <laughs> yes. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you um, about your work as a surrogate partner, and if you could um, unpack for us the difference between a surrogate partner and a somatic sex educator, and what makes this realm of work so valuable, especially in terms of the conversation that we've been having around how to be present with touch and how to determine what it is that you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so... To be clear, my work started out as sex coaching. After a couple of years, I opened it, and that was clothed. Um, it's pretty careful, kind of structured. is experiential, but it was clothed, or at least I was clothed, and sometimes the people were, depending on what we're doing. And after a while, I realized that I was interested in offering more specifically erotic experiences for people for whom it was useful. And so I started, uh, I started offering uh, more erotic experiences, which means I was willing to get undressed. And so I call that sex work. And, and sex work is very broadly defined. So that's why I say some of it legal, some of it questionable, because that was not legal. Um, but a somatic sex educator, and again, this is a very broad range of ways people practice. You may be we may be completely clothed in our office doing exercises, but the thing is that it's, it's somatic means it's body experience based. So I may be leading you through um, movement. I may be leading you through breath. We may be touching in some way that's not terribly sexy. It could, you know, that there's that in there's um, uh, maybe I'm giving you an erotic massage and helping you learn how to sustain your arousal or helping you learn how to be comfortable with the fact that you have desire, uh, maybe you're role playing. It, it's a very wide range. Um, a, sur a surrogate partner is a very specific practice. And that is that um, we work, there's three of us. There's you, the client, there's me, and there's your therapist, and the three of us are talking to each other. So that this is came out of Masters and Johnson in the 50s and 60s, where they were creating these exercises for couples to do. But if someone didn't have a partner, they needed someone to practice with. So then they called a surrogate. And um, uh, 
a lot of people think that, well, surrogate means that's the person you can have sex with. And you might, but not usually. Most of what you need to learn about sex, you learn before you ever get your clothes off. So it's uh, surrogates may, you know, help you learn how to groom. They may help you. They may role play with you asking for a date. They may role play and go out on a date. You know, there's lots of different things that a surrogate might do, but they are working with the therapist. Um, a a, uh, a somatic sex educator or a sexological body worker or sacred intimate, um, they may consult with therapists from time to time, but the therapist is not guiding the session as, a, as you would with a surrogate partner. So I've done all those. Um, and uh, I haven't done very much as a surrogate partner because um, there, no, there were no therapists around. Uh, to to engage in that type of dynamic, um, but I did on occasion consult with people's therapists with their permission. Um, but mostly, I was working on my own. So, you know, in your work, um, in all these variety of capacities, and also, you know, you are training people in this uh, class like a pro um, to help other people who do touch to be more aware of these questions that we've been asking, right? Which is like, is this for me? Is this for you? Are we in some version of autopilot, right? Yeah, right. Um, and, you know, I'd love to get your perspective on the value of um, a client seeing any one of us who are in this this realm of sexu- hands-on sexuality work. Yeah. Like what, yeah. if, if somebody's watching this and they're like, that's not for me, or I don't understand who would do that, right? What, mm-hmm. what are some of the benefits? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Benefit is, you know, if I'm a therapist or a coach, we can talk all day long about what your experience is. But until you have a physical experience of what you're talking about, number one, I can't see it. And number two, there's things that you cannot find until you have a physical experience. And so as a somatic sex educator, for example, we can be in experiences and I can see how you respond, which otherwise nobody would ever see. And I can say, what happened just there? I noticed that you stopped breathing. Did you notice that? And then we pause and we play there and see what happens and what we discover. Um, So, um, yeah, it's, it's having the physical experience that you, that you cannot replace the somatic experience. It's not for everybody. A lot of people are not comfortable with the idea. A lot of people are just not interested. Um, you may be intimidated by the idea. Um, and what I'd recommend is that you interview your potential educator or therapist which you would do anyway um, before you choose a therapist um, to find out what they do and what they think about this, that, and the other, because it needs to be a good match for you. Someone who's a, who would be a great client for me may not be a fit for somebody else and vice versa. There are people who, who I'm not a good fit for and they need to see somebody down the road. Yeah. I I love that you brought up that piece of, um, you know, hey, did you notice that you stopped breathing there? (laughs) Uh Because, you know, that's one of the responses that I think most of us humans have when we're (laughs) tapping into something that doesn't feel great, right? It's not, we're, that's not a moment when we're moving to, like you said, the, the thing that would feel really amazing, the really great experience that we'd love to have. And often it's so unconscious. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one, one of the things I find so valuable about and just so humbling uh, about being in this position in this work is to be with someone in that moment and to oh, bring that yeah. that yeah. moment of what's unconscious into consciousness and see yeah. how it then, you know, changes the rest of the, the moment or the rest of the yeah. life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, we don't, we don't have that kind of... Um, teaching or opportunity sometimes yeah. when we're with our partners. So yeah. I, 
I really just want to appreciate this work that you've created for us and, and you know, through the will of consent and the, the, this, the three minute game, because it gives us a, a moment of an opportunity to slow down enough mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. be able to get um, those gems of wisdom that we might need to go, you know, see a professional mm-hmm. for, right. Yeah. To get that kind of observation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I just really want to thank you for that. Um, so your book, Wheel of Consent, comes out very soon. About a month. In about a month. Great. Yeah. And um, it'll be available for all of us to go and read. Now, you have a um, Facebook group community, right, that folks can join yes. and be a part of. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what that community is, is like? And so if, if folks want to join, what would they get out of it? Um. It's mostly people sometimes ask questions about the wheel of consent. And a lot of it is, as it is on Facebook, posting something you saw, you know, this article that you saw. Um, And I, in particular, um, like to post things about how the wheel applies in life outside of the bedroom. So I I post a fair number of um, social issues and politics and things that, you know, show as an example, you know, someone, um, uh, you know, saying stop and showing how this is the allowing quadrant. This is the edge of the allowing quadrant saying, no, stop here. You don't get to do this. Or here's an example of someone in the serving quadrant, you know, arranging food banks in Wyoming and, um, and there's a fair amount of discussion about um, sexuality issues. Um, you know, people will, might link to an article on how to have great sex or something. Um, and people sometimes post events that they're teaching that are real or consent related. Yeah. yeah. Great. It's a very loosely facilitated group. It's not real strict. Great. I love that you are, you know, creating a space that allows us to see how these dynamics that you have unpacked for us in this wheel of consent around touch um, actually show up in so many other places in Mm -hmm. our relationships, in our emotional dynamics with each other, the language that we use, but also how they show up in the outer world, right? Because Um, so many times when I have had conversations um, with my clients around owning their power and taking their pleasure and like really allowing themselves to have more. They're like, Whoa, that's, you know, the only models I've seen of that are top down, dangerous, violent. Right. right? Right. So, you know, part of, I think what you've really created is, is really giving us a model that shows us how we can, we can have our power, right. We can have our cake and eat it too. Um, and that we don't, we we're not mimicking something out from the outside world, you know, the greater, larger dominant culture that we, we really don't. So it allows us to actually create new culture. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm really thankful of. I want to, I want to kind of give an, an overview or you're asking earlier about what's the 30,000 foot view. And I think what will help is noticing that or acknowledging that the wheel of consent is a practice in taking turns Mm. that's really all it is it's a practice in taking turns and when we set aside a time to practice like you know we're going to play for an hour or something then we divide up the time so that it's my turn for this time it's your turn for this time and you don't get to skip your turn and say oh but i love to give to you great it's your turn to give me and then it's my turn to give to you so it's a practice in taking turns. So when we're saying, when it's your turn, you get to be selfish, meaning put yourself first. You're still respecting the other person's boundaries, of course, but it's about what you want. And when you are on the giving side, when it's their turn, you still respect your own boundaries, but you take your desires and you put them on the shelf because it's not about you. So I think it's important to note that you have some time in each role. I'm not saying get selfish in your life. No, 
that, that I don't recommend that, you know, um, and neither am I saying just give more and everyone will be happy. That's not true either. Yeah. So the wheel of consent is a practice in, in taking turns and taking, receiving and giving apart. So it's 100% for you or it's 100% for them. And through doing that, you have experiences that are possible no other way. Mm. When it's totally my turn, I can have experiences that I just don't find any other way. Mm. And same when it's your turn, you know. So um, just to clarify that, you know, kind of going for what you want. Yeah, when it's your turn, absolutely go for what you want. When it's their turn, what you want doesn't matter. Your boundaries matter, but your preferences don't matter. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What a valuable distinction uh, and, and a valuable practice, taking turns. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's Great. something so that we, really right, simple. yeah. I mean, it, it, it is, it strikes me as really profound and also like, well, I, I remember hearing that when I was a kid and somehow yeah. as an adult, wow, it really went sideways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Betty, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you uh, and go a little bit deeper in the wheel of consent is a great honor and a, a privilege of mine to have you here. So thank you so very much. You are so welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And for all of our viewers, please come back tomorrow for another really rich conversation in the exploration of sexual satisfaction and all of the juicy goodies that it entails.